Portugal, da Escola de Inverno dos Dias Feministas de Saber, nossa segunda escola, e também uma sessão especial do Gender Workshop, como sabem, é um, um ciclo que já completa 10 anos no Centro de Estudos Sociais. Cabe-me a mim, porque sou professora aqui nesta casa, dar as boas-vindas a vós, à grande mentora e organizadora destas nossas escolas de cuidadania, cidadania, que é a minha irmã, mana inspiradora, a nossa Teresa Cunha, e sobretudo à nossa convidada especial hoje, vinda de um país que acho que talvez nunca tenha tido alguém a falar aqui nesta casa, é só a Zilândia, o novo nome que eu não sei dizer, é esse quartinho, obrigada, que é também a nossa inspiradora, pensadora feminista, a Patrícia Marcana. Eu estou aqui somente para dar essa boa-vinda e também depois de haver algum problema, digamos, com o livro, para dar-me alguma questão que possa ver. Vou agora então dar as boas-vindas à nossa convidada. Que foi a fundação, a fundação Alemã, 
que tem, que tem, que está baseada no clube também, e que aceitou o desafio de poder facilitar a vida da Patrícia. Uh, e não só, uma companheira nossa também, no Sandicana, a Brenda Campos, que eu estou a ver, mas acho que está aqui. Ah, exato. E eu acho que é importante dizer que nós, nós graças ao dinheiro social-democrata ou não, conseguimos trazer a Patrícia na que estava numa feminista radical africana, que com certeza de poder reformar. E que dará com certeza muita, muita coisa para pensarmos e para discutirmos esta tarde. A Patrícia, apesar dela hoje em dia viver em Iswatini, que é o nome que hoje eu tive o terreno da sua Zilândia tinha, agora chama-se Reino Iswatini, é um pequeno país que faz fronteira com a África do Sul e fronteira com Moçambique, na África Austral, Oriental. Apesar disso, a Patrícia é uma pessoa que não é propriamente só, ela tem um passaporte de lá, mas ela viajou por tudo quanto é lugar em África e não só, também fora da África. Então eu sou altamente cosmopolita e quase que fico constrangida de dizer que ela vem de, da Suazilândia, muito mais do que isso. Mas enfim, isso já estou, já me dou um pouco sobre a Patrícia. Eu espero que vocês apreciem estar aqui. Esta é uma escola. Uh, este, este lugar também é particular e eu queria chamar a atenção. Este foi um, um edifício construído durante os anos 50 em plena aula do Real Fascismo em Português. Portanto, não é por acaso que estamos aqui, porque nós estamos aqui também para conviver com a cidade nas suas diversas interpretações e contradições. É bom que vocês sintam aqui também esta, este ambiente, esta atmosfera que é bastante diferente da, do SES. Uh, para também a gente poder problematizar todas essas coisas. Eu vou fazer uma pequena apresentação em português da Patrícia e depois farei em inglês para ela se sentir acolhida, tá bom? Então, Patrícia McFadden, proudly a black woman, como ela pensa e descreve-se, descreve a si mesma, a partir da sua jornada de vida, que vai desde os tempos da militância comprometida no ANC. A ANC é o, é o movimento anti-apartheid da África do Sul contra o apartheid, até às montanhas de Iswatini, onde escolheu viver como uma confiança. Para ela, as feministas devem pensar em contemporaneidade, sem temer falar do feudalismo patriarcal presente nos nacionalismos também africanos e que faz da vida das mulheres um inferno. Devem falar também da autossuficiência anticapitalista, que é possível imaginar e construir do internacionalismo feminista para que a solidariedade entre lutas faça sentido e das relações de poder escondidas em cada palavra, sobretudo naquelas que estão tão na mão. Patricia McFadden is a radical feminist who aspires to a life of freedom and joy. She says, my university teaching experience spans a period of four decades in various parts of the world. I began teaching in 1976, when most of you were not yet born. As a graduate assistant in the Department of Political Sciences in University of Botswana and Swaziland. Since then, I have taught and undertaken supervision at the undergraduate and postgraduate levels in the departments of political science, sociology, African studies, women's studies, and African leadership, as well as served in several capacities as a dean and as a head of the department during various times in my teaching career. I have supervised large numbers of graduate students at the master's and PhD level over the past 40 years and served as an external examiner to the University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, Sweden, Netherlands, Botswana, Zimbabwe, and Syracuse University for undergraduate and postgraduate students. I continue to work with students in European and African universities, often as a shadow supervisor. 
seldom receiving remuneration for my mentoring and academic support work. I'm a vegan and I produce most of my own organic food on a mountain in eastern Oswatini. My most recent publication is Contemporary Sufficiency in a Radical African Feminist Life. You recall, I remember Patricia, the first time I met you, I was making my research to my PhD and I, I found a text uh, in the internet saying, radically speaking, <laughs> and I was so amazed about this text. It, it's not so big text, but it's so inspiring and, and so this radicality was really very, very important to me. And since that day, so many years ago, <laughs> I was dreaming to have you here with us. And the first time we met in person, it was last year, um, I confirmed completely that it would be even more interesting uh, your work in person than all the texts that I have uh, read from you. So thank you so much and enjoy people. Thank you. Oh, oh, it's so lovely. Um, I, like I think all of us in this room, love to talk. <laughs> That's why we're teachers and learners, hopefully. And so, um, and I like to meet I like to go off in, on little paths. And I'm going to control that impulse by reading my text. <laughs> so that uh, when you ask me a question, I can actually go into the text and say, this is what I said. Because often you forget when you are extemporizing. You don't remember really. It's like all these amazing inventions that are happening in your head, stimulated, I think, by the pleasure of being intellectually active. And this is, one, this is the main reason that I, I do intellectual work. It's because it's such a tremendous source of pleasure. And uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. And I will read. Um, firstly, let me thank Teresa and all of you who have created this site of feminist engagement and celebration. I was asked to read slowly. <laughs> and the, the more intense the pleasure, the faster I read and speak. <laughs> Keep my eye on Teresa's face so that she can say more than more day. So I'd like to thank you, really, with all my heart, and all the, the women, the people, the humans oh, who have created the site of feminist engagement and celebration for inviting us, Brenda and I, to participate in the dreaming of a new and different inclusive tomorrow. We've traveled a long distance because we love being part of the initiative of imagining and crafting alternative societies everywhere in the world. I've looked forward to this collective embrace since the moment when Teresa propose the idea of my visit because being together thinking sharing debating learning expanding and growing in new ways for me is the oxygen of freedom seekers those of us who love freedom Many of us have spent our lives searching, experiencing freedom, struggling, insisting upon freedom, and not compromising. And this is not unique to us. Many, many have come before us. Um, 
and have left us legacies uh, on which we, we step forward. So this oxygen is a necessary part of being engaged in the experience, in the search for freedom. And we are the quintessential seekers of freedom in its most complete possibilities. I'm going to say some things that most of you know, but I'm just going to reiterate them because I think they help to map the discursive space and also they provide markers that we can find familiarity with. Feminism arises as an ideology and politics of women's resistance to exclusion and all that it encompasses and means in the realities of our lives. And as a lifestyle, it arises as a lifestyle and celebration of the immense possibilities of living lives of joy that are sufficient and enough. It emerges out of the realization that in resisting the patriarchy, we initiate the future. That our courage is the force that pushes wide open the doors to an alternative vista of life and collective existence. It is this instinct which becomes the seed from which our radical and resilient, resilient consciousness and determination sprout. And for me, this has been my personal political oxygen since my teenage years when I first picked up a second-hand copy of Simone de Beauvoir's Second Sex. <laughs> and I was about 15, 16. <coughs> and the colonial women would come to Europe in the summertime and they would buy uh, texts. And then they would read them in the colonies. And then they would sell them for kittens as part of fundraising for the local hospital or, you know, the philanthropy of the daughters of the empire. And I would buy my books from this one woman who sat outside a pharmacy in a town quite a distance from where, uh, from our town. And I, my father would take me with him every month we would go and get supplies. And so I would get a small allowance, and then I would buy books, and I would sit on the pavement next to this woman, <laughs> and uh, I would read and wait for my father to come and pick me up. Several hours later, I had gone to buy various things, flour, my mother had always a list like that. Um, and, and so this, this personal political oxygen, for me, has been a, a, a crucial source of my life, my development, who I am as a radical woman. One of the legacies that I've inherited from feminism as a universal women's politics is the license to position myself within any discourse to which I bring my ideas and imaginaries and to understand and use my subjectivities as the wedge with which to push on intellectual boundaries within and beyond the academy, so as to provoke new practices of activism and engagement through the authentic authenticity of my own desires and yearnings for freedom. And remember, I, I, I want to extemporize, extemporize quickly. When uh, Brenda and I arrived at the airport in Lisbon, there was a woman who had been stalking us, kind of, since Berlin, sort of trying to lean into the energy that we were generating because we have these political conversations non-stop, except when we are sleeping. In <laughs> we wake up and the first thing we say is, you know what, I'm just thinking about <laughs> everybody around us is like, who are these crazy women? Well, why don't they shut up? I want to sleep. So, you know, so she had been trying to lean in and uh, for us to see her. So we, we were waiting for our baby, and she came um, to us and said, 
where are you from? And you know, it's such a moment of culture shock for you because you realize that you're a black exotic in Europe. It's the exotic moment. And I'm like, where am I from? From the world, of course. <laughs> There, because nobody asks a question like that in Southern Africa, I mean, particularly in Southern Africa. So she then told us that she had spent time in Mozambique in Ampula, and that she was doing this work with initiation rites and with female genital mutilation. And uh, how wonderful she thought it was, and how the women loved it and did it to themselves. I mean, it was so gross. It was so grotesque. And my mind was racing and I was thinking, you know, I should put my fist in the face, but then they'll arrest me. <laughs> um, or I should find a way of talking with her, but then she's irrational. I mean, really, it's, 20, it's the 21st century, okay? You don't know who I am, and you're telling me that the mutilation of my black body is something that I like? How dare you? You know, but she was so upset when I, I asked her. So, so we had this argument. Of course, immediately we were in an argument. And then I, I asked her, so okay, do you agree or not agree that every human being has a right to bodily integrity? That every human being who arrives on this planet is entitled to decide what happens to their body, that it is a right. She said, no. I said, it's a universal right. She said, no, it's not a universal right. It's only the Europeans who think that way. And it was shocking. I mean, I was like, I was so upset. She spoiled my whole trip. But um, she then fled. Uh, and I told her, why don't you go and cut the vaginas of all the little girls here in Europe and then let them tell you how much they like it. And she fled with this look of fear. She told me that I had a serious ideological problem. I was like, yes, yeah, the pot calling the kettle black. <laughs> but the point is this. The universalization of feminism and the universalization of rights and entitlements, like bodily integrity, is I think one of the key challenges that faces us as women who name ourselves feminists. Because disrupting colonial discourses about the black body, regardless of where it is situated, is so central to creating the alternative in new and sufficient ways. And to challenge universalism by claiming that because we were colonial subjects, we cannot be part of a human journey towards the fullness of, of human existence is crazy. But it's very real and it lives in the minds and in the professions and in the ways in which people perceive the other. And I'm not other, and I don't allow anybody to other me, even if I'm a guest in your country. So I told her what I thought about her. And the reason I'm sharing this is because, in so many ways, this discourse about the universalism of women's politics continues to be deeply problematical. And many people still argue that feminism within Africa as well, and within the North. That feminism is a foreign ideology uh, that we as black women are imitating white women. And of course it speaks to a deep sense of insecurity, intellectual insecurity, but it also speaks to um, a disparaging of women as intellectuals and the ideas that we articulate. So I'm starting there. Because I think it's really a critical point to enter, to situate myself in this environment, in this community. So I think in many ways, um, for me, using the legacy 
of a universal struggle against patriarchy allows me license to bring myself to sites of knowledge production and engagement with ideas which are often still considered unscientific by conventional conservatives in the academy and it also uh, is deliberately kept at bay by those who occupy the infrastructures of power and policy making at both the level of the global and national state. For example, the UN is one such example. The depoliticization of women's realities and presences in human life through the continuous manipulation and redefinition of feminist language and ideas into tech speak and statistics reiterates a systematic decentering and distancing of feminist politics from our daily struggles for, su for sufficiency and the lives of dignity. It is a dangerous expression of neoliberal capitalist conservatism which has become normal across all our societies. Profit making, that obscene harnessing of the fetish and its use in exploiting and dehumanizing persons and all sentient beings, profit making has seeped into virtually every, every crevice of social life, distorting our very souls. We have to find the new ways of fighting back by becoming contemporary in radically feminist ways of thinking and living. Coming out of the traditions of anti-colonial resistance in Southern Africa and having experienced erasure and containment of feminist ideas and identities within the ranks of the liberation movements, I realized that not only was a century ending, but the eclipse of nationalism by the exigencies posed by post-liberation and the consolidation of neoliberal capitalism in our region of Southern Africa, that all of these required both an intellectual and existential reconfiguration of my feminist politics and of my relationship with the cosmos. The challenge was how to lean back from the emotional and deeply subjective relationship I had with nationalism as a discourse and practice of resistance against racism and colonial brutality and arrogance on the one hand, whilst acknowledging the influences and crucial insights that resistances to colonialism had bequeathed me. So you can hear that I've centered myself. I'm speaking through my subjective voice. I'm not saying they, I'm saying me and I'm positioning myself that deliberately. These influences and crucial insights that resistances to colonialism had bequeathed me were through the radical traditions of men like Fanon and Cabral in particular. On the other hand, having spent decades located within women specific sites in these large resistance platforms of struggle, my feminist antenna were buzzing with the urgency of creating a conceptual and activist gap across which I could begin to reassess my positioning as a radical woman who had experienced vicious forms of rejection and vilification by gendered nationalists in the African women's movement often through their collusion with the neo-colonial state. Um, I don't know how many of you have read the piece in Meridians, which really inspired this presentation, where I speak to the journey within the African women's movement and trying to be a feminist in a conservative, nationalist-inspired ideological space, and not understanding that actually the moment had moved from sisterhood to solidarity. But that solidarity is a feminist recognition of the power of radicalism, and that sisterhood was embedded 
in essentialisms that made many assumptions that often were traps for us as radical women, that we expected women because they wore or wear the physical bodies of femaleness to be <coughs> radical and to be feminist, which is not the case. So many of the hurts that radical women encountered in women's movements, I think, were, were, were related to this conceptual sort of schism that you wanted to be in the energy that women produce, <laughs> which is a comfort zone and a sense of safety. And you underplay the politics of difference within these collectivities of women. Class differences, racial differences, uh, ableist differences, homophobic or sexual orientation. You know, all the many, many um, elements that, of course, provide the tapestry of intersection intersectionality as a theoretical paradigm as a way of understanding how complex we are and how the feminist politics is deeply complex and always expanding, always morphing, always growing and, uh, and, and always providing us with opportunities to think about ourselves in new ways. So this was a moment of reckoning for me, of rupture really, which had been inevitable. It's only with hindsight, of course, I realized. I, I, I'm carrying all my daggers, the daggers on my back. From the nationalists, the gender of nationalists who saw me as a threat, and I was radicalizing their daughters, and I was disrupting and disturbing the movement, you know, because for them, this movement of women was an opportunity for upward class mobility. Yeah. So, why do you want to spoil it? Just be satisfied that, you know, you earn a nice consultancy and uh, go to the UN for the decade of women and you go to Beijing. And so why do you want to be radical? You're spoiling it. So, it, I think all of us in our lives have been faced with this moment of reckoning the way, where the rupture occurs. And often we're destabilized and overwhelmed by it. But it's really a moment of opportunity to lean back if you can find it within yourself and then to look at the terrain and to learn from it but also to see the new pathways. So this moment of reckoning, of rupture, which had been inevitable since I had declared myself feminist and not a gender activist, it was a shift that occurred as I retrieved both my agency and identity from the homogenizing rhetoric and political dominance that nationalism imposed over all women who embraced the struggle against colonial racism and exclusion. You had to toe the line. This distancing from what is essentially a deeply conservative and misogynistic intellectual and political discourse of nationalism this returned me to the source of my feminist inspiration. And it is in the moment of contemplation and introspection, contextualizing in a crisis, contextualized in a crisis of personal loss and excruciating grief, that I stumbled across the notion of contemporarity. And a word, is it word, this system? They still put red lines under the word. <laughs> Sometimes it, the machine changes it and says, contemporaneous. I said, no, contemporarity. And of course, the red line. Because when you don't conform in the language, in the dominance of the meanings of the language, it will tell you that, no. <laughs> Sometimes you can play a game with your word and it changes it automatically. Now they're making it so that in 
fact, at a certain point, you can't even change it. It just insists that you must. <laughs> the intercourse is the big hegemon <laughs> in Silicon Valley. <laughs> so it was in this moment of very personal, subjective reflection, having spent 40 years in the liberation struggle, I entered as a teenager, 16 years old, dreaming of freedom. And of course, spurred on by Simone, and then I went on to read, you know, so many amazing women from all over the world. And I became an, an internationalist, not in the ways that the old lady left defined it, although, of course, I come from those traditions and I, I, I learned a lot, but really from the ways in which feminists redefined internationalism and then of course <coughs> provided us, provided ourselves with the notion of solidarity that anchored our women's struggles. So to be sure, the idea of inventing a new word, a term, an expression that might eventually become a useful and dynamic tool in the feminist lexicon in my geospatial location of anti-patriarchal politics on the African continent. This idea draws its features from the radical traditions that have infused my personal political journey as a non-conforming cisgender heterosexual female. And I've always been non-conforming. And I love it. <laughs> you should try it. <laughs> it's very healthy. <laughs> From the memories I have of knowing deep down inside my female soul that I would not willingly allow anyone to violate my bodily and sexual integrity and or that I would fight with all I had if and when such instances did occur. And they did, occasionally, as they do in the lives of all radical women. And from these earliest recollections of mobilizing my instinct of freedom as the inherent power that Audre Lorde so poignantly reminds us about all the time, to the deliberate critiquing of the most radical anti-colonial intellectuals whose courage and insistence on the necessity of reimagining humanism through the practice of freedom as the raison d'etre of all struggles against oppression. From all these resources, these corners of life, I drew the inspiration and the daring to begin thinking beyond nationalism and to push on the boundaries of feminism as I had learned and lived it for the, for the past five decades of my life. I tried to explain this process a little further in the article that inspired this book to go to the Coimbra uh, Winter Feminist School. And I also look forward to our conversation in the next part of this afternoon. So I can't dwell on it really, but I thought it might be a useful kind of backdrop. So let me turn to the idea of becoming and being contemporary in the African context as a radical woman who rejects both, both nationalism and patriarchal feudalism, which form the basis of the political and social cultural power that black men in and outside the state exercise over women of all ages across our continent. The glaring, I'm not saying that there are no multinational corporations, they creep around, you know, in the dark, still funneling the resources out of the continent 500 years later. But it is the black men who occupy the sites of power within the, the state, the colonial state, as a neo-colonial state. And <coughs> these are, these are the, the, the possessors of power now. Um, The glaring absence of a systematic and substantive feminist critique and outright rejection of feudalism in all its guises as a cultural authenticator 
which continues to be deployed by both Western anthropologists and right-wing black nationalists and too many Africans, is one of the core challenges that the notion of contemporarity poses for feminism in an African context. This critique contains within it a necessary questioning of why in our continental context and across the many communities of the black diaspora, we have attached a geospatial nationalist inspired moniker to our feminism, distinguishing it as African and thereby locking its meanings and cadences into conservative traditions and discourses of identity and sameness. It's like wearing a badge that does not allow any room for critical interrogation and or distancing from the political traditions of anti-colonialism and decolonization. This was and remains a powerful hold that nationalists have over the character of black women's politics. All the debates that continue to rage about the supposed uniqueness of black and African feminism are pegged on a nationalist definition of Africanness which is both conservative and deeply patriarchal. Of course we remain black in a white, racist, capitalist dominated world and we will continue to resist the barbarism of racism and discrimination and always remind the barbarians that our humanity is not negotiable. However, we cannot continue to be defined through patriarchal tropes and discourses that undermine our feminist agencies and futures. For me, this is one of the core tasks that contemporarity poses to women who name themselves feminist. In my opinion, it is time to bring our personal sensibilities of agency and critical thinking to this coupling of being African with being feminist. By interrogating the meanings of Africa and of being African in and through a female body and a feminist political awareness, of the tensions and contradictions that women's freedoms pose to those who occupy the state and the various infrastructures of political surveillance and control in our society. We have to lean back from the deeply etched and learned feelings and habits that have sustained feudalism as a uniquely African identity. It's called culture. It is feudalism. With the hindsight of recognition, of course, that retrieving the past for Africans was essential to re-establishing our humanity in the face of continuing racial and colonial dehumanization of Africans as a people. We have to resist the nationalist demand that we be loyal to a hegemonic discourse of race identity, even as we continue to struggle against racist exclusion and white privilege. And we have to reject this entrenched source of egregious patriarchal dehumanization of us as women, which exists in our lives in the guise of cultural custodianship. And we do this by crafting alternative identities that are reflective of how we are reimagining Africa in spatial, cultural, artistic, and futuristic ways unless we engage in this contemporary theoretical and activist rebellion of African normativity, we will not be able to initiate and or sharpen the cutting edge of critical resistance that makes feminism the touchstone of human progress. As I explore <coughs> the notion of contemporarity, which thrives also at the interface of a critique of feminism in its most general meanings, i.e. as the embrace and defense of our bodily and sexual integrity, dignity, well-being, and personhood as female humans, the challenge is how to compose a critique of how these foundational notions and activism, and the activism that, is, that has given them relevance and power to transform lives for the better part of a century, 
how these have been tempered and adjusted in problematic ways by globalized capitalist rhetoric of empowerment, rights, and democracy. So feminism itself is permeated and is permeable to all the rhetorical strategies, um, the discursive um, interferences, if I may call it that way, and interventions. And uh, for me, in many ways, the way I learned, experienced, lived feminism in my teens, and now, as a 68-year-old woman, uh, uh, there are gaps, there are spaces. And so I'm looking for a, a way, a notion, that I can bring to feminism as I've known it, which will reinvigorate, sharpen, um, stimulate the dynamic of this amazing political tradition so that I can continue to live my life as a radical feminist, as a radical woman. Um, and I live in a very, very repressive monarchical dictatorship. I don't say anything, of course. Otherwise, if you wouldn't see me, he's sitting here in front of you. I'd be rotting in a jail. So, as a universal language of women's resistances to patriarchy in, in context specific ways and strategies, feminism has entered the 21st century burdened by the legacies of ideological diversity and institutionalization within the academy in all our societies. As the academy has become corporatized and isolated from the lived struggles of women of all classes, races, gender, and sexual orientations, and identities, abilities, ages, and social statuses. Side by side with this isolationism of a discourse and politics that of necessity must position female agency and subjectivity at its core, side by side with this is the urgent need to revisit feminism's foundational values of integrity, dignity, autonomy, and personal for women and for all human beings, particularly given the intensifying ecological and wider environmental crises, which are refocusing our agencies and resistance instincts around planetary survival and the relationship of humans and other sentient beings to the cosmos. For example, Feminist solidarity has been crucial in our struggle to universalize bodily and sexual integrity as an ethical and humanistic response to the mutilation of female bodies, the earlier conversation. Regardless of whatever forms these take, particularly on the African continent, it has been an effective counter to reactionary appropriations and the fracturing of resistance language and activism. This energy of struggling collectively around issues of common interest affecting our autonomy and entitlement to live and love in whole bodies is witnessing a revival in the new challenges posed by the need to move from a notion of sustainability to sufficiency. To move beyond the very meaning of sufficiency in its limited understanding as being nurturing of the self and community, to recognizing and exploring the power of integrity as inherently embedded in a radical notion of sufficiency. So bringing the core values that drive, that provide oxygen to feminism, to living as a feminist, to imagining the alternative, bringing those to the crisis that we are facing as humans and as radical humans, the ecological and other crises, then asking where are the interfaces, where are the new ideas, where are the new energies, where can we excavate, where can we expand the possibilities of moving our societies in alternative directions. Every human being arrives on the planet 
with everything they need to live a life of exceptional creativity, expression, invention, celebration, and fulfillment. Every single one of us is enough. We are enough. We arrive with everything we need. And that, for me, informs not only our relationship with the cosmos and other sentient beings, but also its core to the notion of feminist autonomy. So making the links between who we are in the circuits of the universe and responding to the challenges and the crises that are facing us as humans who have so depleted and degraded the whole that is our planet. In doing that, we reinvest feminism with new energy, with new possibilities, and we make the connection. Because in many instances, we no longer remember that our core values as feminists really are embedded in the forces of life. And it is the collective expression of our brilliance that constitutes sufficiency in its most complete sense imaginable. However, as humans, we have traveled across time and space through invented systems and infrastructures of power and exclusion on the one hand, whilst we survive and thrive in the love, creativity, and celebration of our beauty on the other. It is a deeper, and fresher understanding of how resilience is the cause of our excellence as living beings, which we must now retrieve and bring to our search for the intersections between our bodies, lives, and existence in the face of all the crises that capitalist plunder and greed brought upon us and our planet. And so to conclude, it is a return, it is the necessity of a return to the self in making the personal and public political and urgent that we must now bring a contemporarity into the ways we live in our bodies and the use and use the understanding and wisdom that a loved body bequeaths us to support and heal ourselves and our communities. I want to read that paragraph again. <laughs> if I can have, extract a bit more pleasure out of it. It is a return to the self in making the personal and public political and urgent that we must now bring as contemporarity into the ways we live in our bodies and use the understanding and wisdom that a loved body bequeaths us to support and heal ourselves and our communities. It is the retrieval of radical left <coughs> of struggles of struggle and equity which have endowed feminism with much of its depth and breadth as an alternative humanistic practice and politics, which we must reinsert into our struggles for lives of dignity and self-worth. Resisting militarism, debt, and the deepening commodification of the very essence of life is a challenge that we cannot assume has been responded to in a world where the Trumps and Bolsonaro's of the empire rail and howl against our entitlement to live sufficiently with all sentient beings. We have to find the contemporary explanations of the intricacies of neoliberal capitalism and its consequences for ourselves and our communities as we theorize and strategize against, against extractivism as the motor force that drives exploitation and profit making. From the mining, the human body as a site of surplus value to the plunder and desecration 
of the Earth's lifeblood. Contemporarity enables us to position ourselves in dynamic and revolutionary ways wherever we are located in our social terrains and to bring our agency to the particular challenges that face us in the intimacy of our private and public lives. These are the beautiful tasks that await us as radical women and persons who love themselves enough to listen to our inner souls and to embrace the courage of crafting the future present so that we can fulfill our individual and collective destinies as some of the most astounding expressions of the universe on the planet Earth, because that's what we are. We are this magical expression of the universe, and we move around on this amazing planet. These are the beautiful tasks that await us as radical women and persons who love themselves enough to listen to our inner souls and to embrace the courage of crafting the future present so that we can fulfill our individual and collective destinies as some of the most astounding expressions of the universe on planet Earth. I wish you love. Thank you.